Good morning, online audience. We're coming at you from the stream station here at Tab Church. I got my friends Michelle and Anna here. Uh, we just want to welcome you. Happy Easter. Michelle, what are you excited about this Easter? I'm excited that God has risen today and that we are able to celebrate and reflect on his, on his resurrection today. Amen. Amen. Anna, what are you excited about? Um, I'm excited that we have risen with the risen Christ and Amen. we are already risen with him. And we can rejoice in that fact that we are risen in him and with him. Praise God. Praise God. Well, if y'all want to uh, shift over right quick, uh, I have, as you can tell, the stream team here with none other than the Jonathan and Caitlin. Uh, they're the reason you're able to see us right now. They're the reason uh, that you can see the, and experience the church online. We're so happy about that. Uh, so make sure you engage with each other. All right. The uh, online stream is its own church building in a sense. I know it looks a little different in modern day, but go ahead and reach out to each other. Wish each other a happy Easter. Talk about what you're doing. Uh, all sorts of stuff like that. But we're so excited you're here with us on the stream, and we look forward to connecting with you. Uh, enjoy the service. I'm excited to worship with you. God bless. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.
Good morning, good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see you all in the house of the Lord today. If you're out in the atrium, we ask that you join us here in the sanctuary as we begin on this morning our service of resurrection and praising the one true king this morning. And we ask that you stand to your feet this morning as we start with singing to our living hope. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into Cross 
Happy Easter to each and every one of you. It is so amazing to be here with you all this morning as we celebrate our Savior defeating death. And a very special thank you to all of our first time guests for allowing us the honor to spend Easter with you here today. A single service is not nearly enough time to get to know you. And so we'd just like to extend an opportunity to you to allow us to keep getting to know you. For the next four weeks, we will be here at church, but on Wednesday nights at 5.30, we'd be honored if you came to allow us to get to know you. A single service is not nearly enough time. As you all know, our favorite yapper, I mean, Pastor Craig, seems to do all the talking around here. And so we'd love it if you join us Wednesday nights at 5.30 here at TAB for a family meal. And I promise it's real food, no junk, 
made with real quality ingredients, made by a real chef, and you definitely don't want to miss out. And it's going to be so much fun, so I hope to see you here. And just to recap, so we're all on the same page, we look forward to seeing you when? And where? Yeah. <laughs> Great. And also to our first time guests, if you haven't already, please make sure you stop by the welcome table after service and pick up a little welcome gift bag from us here at TAB. Inside you'll find a meal ticket for the, fam for the family meal and we'd be so happy if you join us. Now, let us continue worship as Pastor Craig tells us about what wasn't in the tomb and what that means for us. Let's take a look at the bumper video. <laughs> A virgin birth. It is what did not happen that made Jesus' worldly entrance so special. Despise your enemies. It is what Jesus did not do that made him different. Help those in need on the Sabbath. Jesus did not listen to the old laws of the Pharisees. Hate those who persecute you. Jesus did not. Consider the king yet wore a crown of thorns. Jesus was not angry at those who put him on the cross to die. And after three days, it's what wasn't in the tomb. All right. Well, happy Easter. How's everyone doing out there? Amen. Well, I am, uh, I'm Pastor Craig, and I know what you're thinking. That's a weird name for my parents to, uh, to name me. No, that's just my title, okay? But you can, uh, you can call me whatever you like. Um, it is good to see you, especially if you're a first-time guest. Thank you for being with us today and uh, on this Resurrection Sunday. Well, maybe you've had an event happen in your life before that's kind of left you wondering, what now? You know, something so profound that you know things can never be the same. So maybe the event you're thinking of is a, is a sad one, right? Something that was kind of painful in your life. Or maybe it is something that brings you a lot, of, a lot of joy. We all have those events in our life, those, those events that kind of stand out in our, in our minds. And what I want us to, to think about today, when those events happen, and when something is so profound, right, there are some events that happen in our life that are, that are so profound, they're hard for us to, to process through. All we can really do is, is wonder, what now? What do, we, what, do we do, what do we do with this? There's a couple events that come to, to my mind, right? And one's kind of a, you know, maybe a little bit funny or just a, um, something we've all experienced before. But have you ever watched a movie that just kind of, leaves you at the point of just, wow, that was, that was, a, that was a profound profound thing, right? I don't know why, but, but movies with animals always get to me. I don't cry a lot, but I do cry like Homeward Bound or Where the Red Ferns Grow, right? Some, anything to do with like dogs, I, cat people, I, I don't understand you, but, <laughs> but dogs get, get to me every, every time. There was another event in my life that it was a swirl of emotion that was going on, right? And another time that I cry, I'm an internal processor. So if I can't, if I can't fully grasp uh, what's happening or I feel like I don't have adequate words for that, that's another time in my life where sometimes I can just, it's just the raw emotion that comes out. And I'll never forget on my wedding day, right? I looked out and Bethany, my, my bride, was so beautiful and she was walking down the aisle. I'll never forget that that day and I, I was one of those grooms. I, I did shed a few tears on, on that day, right? And I was looking at Bethany coming down the aisle and then I looked out at the other corner of my eye and I saw all my college friends next to me and I knew, I knew things would never be the same again, you know? And so I was, I was, I was crying out of both eyes but for two different, two different reasons, if, that, if you're tracking with that one. And so, all that to say, right, we have these events that happen sometimes that are a swirl of emotion that are, they're just difficult for us to, to process through. And so today, as we look at the resurrection story and as we look at the ladies that, that arrived at the tomb on that first Easter morning, I want us to try to put ourselves in their 
shoes because we look back on these events with 2,000 years of history on them and we kind of look at the resurrection event as this clean event because we see now the results of that. But I want us to try to put our, our selves in the shoes of these first ladies that arrived there on that first Easter morning. And Mark's gospel account actually gives us a, a great opportunity to do just that. We've got four accounts of the resurrection story, right? There's four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they're all different accounts of the resurrection, not in a not in a bad way. They're all different accounts because they give us a complementary view of what happened on that first Easter Sunday. But here's what's unique about Mark's account of what, of what happened that day. We are confronted with the empty tomb. And we never see the resurrected Jesus in Mark's account of the resurrection story. It's bizarre. It ends in this bizarre kind of a way. And I wrestled with this over the years. Like, why would Mark end his gospel account in such a bizarre, in a bizarre way? But I think what Mark is doing is he's giving us an opportunity. He's giving us a chance to step into the shoes of those first people that arrived at the tomb that day. And we have to ask ourselves the question, as we consider the empty tomb today, what now? What now? Because we could show up today and we could have a, a great Easter service and we could look at the resurrection story in a familiar way and we can almost become so numb to it that we forget that we have to deal with the empty tomb. Every single one of us has to. We either walk away from it unchanged or we recognize that if Jesus did do what he said he did and he walked out of the grave three days later, defeating death so that we can have new life in Christ, how can that not change everything? Look, we, we're in a room of people. I know there are difficult situations in our in our life that we face, we all have these difficult situations or we have these things in our life, maybe these situations that we don't see a path forward. How in the world could, am I ever going to make it through this? And this is what the empty tomb reminds us of, that God can do a lot in three days, right? Change the world. And so today, as we look at this account through Mark, I want us to arrive to the empty tomb with the ladies that, that arrived that day as they showed up to the empty tomb. And I want us to ask the question for ourselves, what now? What are we going to do with this information? So turn in your Bibles. Let's look at, at Mark chapter 16. And I'm going to read for you uh, verses 1 through 8. And here is how Mark, the writer of this gospel, gives us the account of that Easter morning. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so, so that they could go and anoint him. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb at sunrise. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb for us? Looking up, they noticed that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in, in a white robe sitting on the right side. They were alarmed. God would have been too. <laughs> Don't be alarmed, he told them. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth. You are looking for the man, Jesus, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they put him. 
but go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. They went out and ran from the tomb because trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them. And they said nothing to anyone since they were afraid. Mark 16, 1 through 8. And that is how Mark ends the resurrection account on that first Easter morning. Isn't that remarkable? What Mark is doing in this account, and I'm... I studied uh, Greek in seminary for a while for four years, so I'm actually much gooder at uh, Greek than I am the English. <laughs> Wait a second, I think I, I think I said that wrong. But if you look at this account from Mark, he's, he's peppering this account with these imperfect verb tenses. And I'm not gonna give you a, a grammar lesson today, but the reason why this is important, why Mark chooses to use these imperfect Greek verb tenses is that Mark is going to pains. He is, he is trying to invite us into the inner workings of the story. Mark is trying to bring us alongside of these women as they arrived at the tomb that day. He's not trying to give us the complete picture. He's not trying to give us a holistic view of what happened on the resurrection morning. He's giving us an opportunity because the invitation hasn't, hasn't changed. The invitation is still the same. Jesus extends an invitation to come and follow me. For those of us on this side of the crucifixion and the resurrection, we must begin with the Easter morning account. To follow Jesus, we have to do business with the empty tomb we have to peer inside we have to see that nobody saw nobody I don't know I thought that was pretty good man y'all are a tough crowd today anyway you see you see what I'm saying and we have to come to terms what now and Mark doesn't give us the full completed full completed picture we just have to consider what now listen to how the the ladies look before we even get to the way they responded to the empty tomb right they're showing up to the to the tomb not expecting the tomb to be empty I think a lot of times when we look back at the resurrection account right we we know how the story ends, so it's like we're anticipating the empty tomb. But they're, they're trying to put things together, and they don't even have a full, completed plan of, of how these things are going to actually transpire. Because remember, Jesus was placed in the tomb before they were able to complete the job of anointing his body. There was nothing that could be done on the Sabbath. It was... In a Jewish world, it, the world came to a, a halt on the Sabbath. And they didn't have an opportunity to, uh, to properly uh, anoint his body, to prepare his body for death. And they're showing up to the tomb. They're, they're even asking themselves a question. We haven't really thought this through, but who's going to move this big rock out of the way? So when they show up that day and they see that the stone has been moved to the side, they're already perplexed. They're already wondering what, what in the world is going on. And something about that, that stone being rolled away. You know, Jesus didn't need the stone to be rolled away to get out of the grave. You know that, right? That's for you and I. That's for the ladies that showed up that day. It was an invitation. God was inviting them to come and to, to see, look what has been done. But these ladies were not in that frame of mind expecting a resurrection. 
So we see how they are responding in the moment as these events transpire. And listen to, again, one more time, how Mark ends this account in Mark 16, 8. They went out and ran from the tomb because trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them. And they said nothing to anyone since they were afraid. Just to kind of give us a, an idea, because when we see that word trembling and a a lot of translations use different, different words to try to capture this idea. But the Greek word for trembling is tromos. Tromos, it's the same word that we get trauma from. I think trembling kind of undersells what was happening in the event as these ladies were experiencing this. They were literally, this was a traumatic situation for them. The word that we get astonishment from in the Greek is ecstasis. It's this word ecstasy. Talk about a swirl of emotion that they were experiencing as they, as they arrived at the tomb and they saw that there was no body in the tomb. On the one hand, it was this tromos. It was this trauma. It was like, we can't calculate what's happening we don't understand. There's no logical explanation for the, the, what we're seeing with our own eyes here. And yet on the other side, there was this ecstasis. There was this ecstasy. There was this excitement that all of a sudden in their brain, maybe these pieces were coming together that Jesus did do what he said he was going to do. Three days later... I will come out of the grave and I will extend life to everyone because I defeated death on the cross. Death wasn't defeated until Jesus came up out of the grave. And these ladies were processing through such an amazing event. I just want to try to capture that today. Because when we come to these situations of life that are a swirl of emotion that, that we, we can't quite fully grasp or fully understand, we might even say what the ladies had here. It's a, maybe in modern terms, we would say it was kind of an out-of-body experience, right? Maybe you've had one of those in your life before where the things that have transpired, it just does not make logical sense. And when we come to those places in our, in our life, and especially when we think about the event that shaped all of history in the resurrection, we can either look at the things that we, we don't understand and those things that can't, we can't calculate in our human rationale, and we either, approach, we either approach it from a posture of fear well, I don't understand this, so I'm going to keep it at an arm's distance. I don't understand this, so I, there's no way I can accept something that I can't fully grasp. But did you know that's not the only option that we have? The other option is to step into it with faith. Step into it with faith. And here's the thing about faith. Faith isn't the absence of doubt. Faith is leaning in and being open to the things of God. Being open that if God is who he says he is, he can do things in his power and in his timing that I don't have to, I don't have to understand. It's just an openness. And here's what I would challenge us with today. If we haven't come to that place where we've really thought about the empty tomb and the implications of that, I would just challenge us all. We don't have to have all of the, the facts, even though the historical facts of the resurrection are really strong. Jesus showed himself to over 500 people after the resurrection. 
And don't forget that this took place under the authority of the Roman Empire, one of the strongest empires that have ever been on the face of the planet. I'm telling you, if they could have produced a body, they would have produced a body. This was an embarrassment for the Roman Empire. So the facts don't negate it, but I don't, in my experience, it's not the facts that ever change a human heart. And what I want to challenge us with today, you know, God doesn't ask us to have everything figured out. We don't have to have all of the answers. But if you want to experience God in your life, if you want to actually experience the power of the resurrection in your life, do you know we can today? That is a prayer that God will answer for us. And it's simply a posture that says, I don't understand it all, but Jesus, I want to believe. Help me in my unbelief. Would you speak to me and show me your resurrection power in my life? And that is a prayer that God answers 100% of the time. So as we have considered the resurrection story today, and as we have thought about the power of God in our life, I just want to challenge us with that question, what now? If we are believers, and this is a, a time that we love to, to, to gather together and to celebrate every year what Jesus has done in our life. How is the resurrection impacting our life on a daily basis? If God has done for us to this magnitude, how could it not shape the way that we live our, our life? Paul tells us that the same power that rose Jesus out of the grave is accessible to us. Do we believe that today? Are we walking around like we're defeated? Are we walking around like we don't have any hope in our life? There's no body in the grave. And that should change our outlook and our perspective. That Jesus went through hell so that he could reconcile us to the, to the Father. That's how much he loves us. That's the extent he went to extend a relationship with us. How could that not change everything? So today on this Easter, I hope we haven't, I hope we haven't gotten so comfortable with the Easter story that we, we just... We come and we, we consider the tomb and we know the right things, but it's kind of like something that kind of hangs out in, a, in the, the back of our brain that we, we pull out every once in a while, but then we just kind of go on living, living our own life. If the tomb is empty, it changes everything because God has now extended eternal life to us. And eternal life doesn't just begin the moment that we die. For those of us that are believers, eternal life comes and we have access. We have eternal life right now. Life begins the moment that we trust Christ as our Lord and our Savior. And it doesn't mean that everything in life just becomes grand all of a sudden. But what does happen, because all of us were created for a relationship with God... We all were, and we can try to deny it. We can, we can try to fill it with our careers. We can try to fill it with substances. We can try to fill it with human relationships. But if we pause and we stop, I think we all know that when we go down that path, we all still end up empty. We all still leave with a craving for more because we were actually created to have relationship with our heavenly father. And he did it through the cross and through the resurrection. We have life that is available to us. So today, as we consider that question, what 
now? I hope we can answer it in the affirmative that because of my relationship with Jesus Christ, because God has done everything on my behalf, I, I don't have to prove myself anymore. I don't have to try to clean myself up. I don't, I'm not, I don't have to try to enter into a relationship with God based off of what I can bring to the table. That never pans out because we all have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But he bridged the gap. He bridged it. He did it. So that we don't have to live a life of performance. We don't have to live a life of trying to prove why we're worthy. We simply believe and we experience the resurrection power that's available to us in Jesus Christ. Father, we come before you. We love you. We thank you. We pray that we wouldn't become so comfortable with the empty tomb that we forget that as the women showed up that day, that it was, it was a swirl of emotion that they experienced. And I pray that we would sit in that tension sometimes and that we would respond to that question, what now? Not in fear, but we would respond in faith, that we would respond in trust. Thank you, Lord, that you are not distant from us. Thank you that a, a life of connection with God is not some abstract thing, but that when we pray and we, when we ask that you would reveal yourself to us, Lord, that is a prayer that you, you answer. So all we do is we bring an open heart. We, we bring an open heart, open to the things that you want to reveal and show. Thank you that your power is alive in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Hallelujah, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, thank you. Let's put our hands together because we are celebrating the resurrection of our living God, our brother Jesus, who came and died for us to give us eternal life. Amen. We don't have to do anything anymore. He has done it all. So we just have to go to him. Amen.
What a great word Pastor Craig brought to us. He said, nobody saw nobody. That's a wonderful word. It, it invites us to go back, way back, 2,000 years ago, and to lean into that cave and to see and hear the message of the gospel of, that the angels preach. There's nobody. He's been crucified. He has risen. Me. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I'm so glad you're here today. We want to invite you, those who would like to, to come down and to, to answer that question with our deacons here. What now? There's some of you who may have that question. What now for our deacons and our deaconess will be able to help you with that question? Some of you may just want to pray. We invite you to do that. But we also want you to stick around and have fellowship with us in the atrium. You are our family and our friends. And you know, on Easter Sunday, the children look cuter. The women look more beautiful. Look around at all these beautiful women. And the men, well, they look noble. And we're glad you're here. Don't forget, new visitors, to pick up your bag of goodies and merch and all of that that we have here for you. Let's thank the Lord for this time. Let me say a benediction over you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for each one that has come today. We praise you, Lord, for your great grace and your loving kindness to each one. And Father, we pray that as they go, that they will go with the hope of the gospel in their hearts, that this would be a day of peace for them and a day of knowing your compassion and love. Bless our time of fellowship, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You're dismissed.